Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here. Here, once again, is in my sister's basement, also known as my temporary shop. Uh, and we are here today to talk about the Joint Matic. Now, what the heck is a Joint Matic? Well, it's a, a stationary tool. Uh, it's powered by a router motor. You provide the router, and it's designed for making joinery. It, it'll do box joints, finger joints, which are almost the same thing, uh, sliding dovetails, housed dovetails. What the heck is a housed dovetail? It's a, it's a sliding dovetail with glue on it. Um, it can make standard uh, half-blind dovetails. It's even been known to make through dovetails. And it can make mortise and tenon and can even make a complete raised panel door, frame and all. Um, there's so much this thing can do, and we can't cover it all in one video. So in this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of this machine, some, some hints on how to buy it right, because there are many of them out there that have been abused and broken. Uh, I'll give you some hints there. And I'm going to teach you how to not break yours in the first 10 minutes that you own it. So stick around. All right. So first off, I did say this is a shopsmith tool, um, but this isn't the original Joint Matic. The original Joint Matic, as shown in this patent, was patented in 1977 by a gentleman named Donald Strong. Now, Donald uh, actually created a couple products that were pretty popular in the U.S. Um, the Joint Matic was the original one. And he also had a scroll saw that was pretty fantastic. And uh, he went on to sell the license or the rights to use that patent to a, uh, an import company called Secura. And they sold that scroll saw under their brand. And then it was sold by Penn State Industries for a while. And anyway, uh, but the Joint Matic, as it originally appeared in the 1970s and through the 80s, looked like this and had two threaded lead screws that were connected by a bicycle chain. So imagine that you have two huge columns that are threaded, a heavy metal plate that the router is mounted to, a heavy metal base, and as you turn the crank, it turns both lead screws together, raising the router motor up and down evenly. So in the early 1990s, um, Donald Strong visited Dayton, Ohio at the uh, corporate headquarters of ShopSmith. And I was working in the academy, as we call them, in the classroom right off the showroom at the factory. And uh, I was invited into a meeting with Mr. Strong where I got to see and play with his joint Matic. And my understanding at the time was um, he was looking to either sell the patent or to license the use of his patent. But more importantly, he understood that he just wasn't going to be able to hit the masses with the uh, expensive version of the machine that he had created. So he saw that ShopSmith had been doing some innovative things throughout the 80s and early 90s and approached them with the idea of maybe taking the product on. Uh, I don't believe that ShopSmith purchased the patent. They may have. They, they for sure purchased a licensed license to use the patent. And uh, our engineers went to work and came up with this machine. So this is the ShopSmith Joint Matic, quite a bit different than the Strong Joint Matic. The, the first obvious difference, at least to me, when I saw it for the first time, was uh, it has a metal back piece. So this part right here, I think of it as a platen. ShopSmith calls that the slide. Um, it's made of plastic. And in fact, huge backstory we'll talk about midweek that relates to the development of that part. It was a big problem with them to get that just right. Um, but what ShopSmith was wanting to do was not only to reduce cost of this, but also to incorporate a few highly demanded features such as dust collection. The original strong joint Matic had no means of dust collection. You'll notice that there is a single crank the strong joint Matic had a single crank too, but just a single threaded rod. And this is a three eighths inch rod as opposed to about a one inch pair of rods on the joint Matic. How in the world was this thing going to work as well? But we got to find out how well it worked. So this is a three eighths 16 thread, meaning for every time that we turn this crank one time, we will move that slide and therefore the bit a 16th of an inch, either raising it or lowering it. And this is how with this machine, we can get some very accurate joinery. Uh, let me spin this around, show you what happens on the back side. So here on the back, you can see how this plastic slide is, is hollow and ribbed. 
um, the threaded rod passes on through this special little uh, nut configuration that we'll study here in a bit. You have a metal plate that is removable that you can then mount your router to. Um, this is designed to fit all the common routers of the day back in the 90s. Porter Cable 690 was my router of choice. And you, then you have a separate plate over here held in place with two screws that uh, is part of the dust collection. So if you had any clogs, you could take that off really easily and get the dust out. You can also see here that the slide is going up and down on this square steel column with these wheels that are mounted on an eccentric. And with that, we can tighten and loosen those and, and that roller just pinches this glass reinforced plastic slide against the face of that steel rod. So as I mentioned, this is a 3 8 16 thread. This really needs to have some wax put on it in order to maintain it properly. Um, but I'm also very careful about using chemicals around this because this is now a 25 year old plastic part and uh, it could easily be damaged. So for this first cut, I'm gonna use this quarter inch spiral cut router bit. It's important when you purchase a spiral bit that you know which direction it's going to be pulling the chips. This is what's called a, a, an up cut, meaning it's gonna be pulling those chips up towards the motor or towards the collet. A down cut bit is gonna push the chips down into the cut. Uh, for some operations that's appropriate, but we want an up cut here. And I have a DeWalt router that I purchased specifically for this application. Although for years I've used a Porter Cable 690 router, uh, that's been my so in addition to giving us dust collection and reducing from two columns to one, thereby saving us a ton of money, Shopsmith added one more innovation to this machine, which was in the form of a product that they had patented in the 19, early 1990s. And that is a special adjustable miter gauge slot. So not the bar on the miter gauge, but the slot in the table. So this is just a regular T-slot, miter slot that Shopsmith produced and used in a, a number of spots, but uh, they wanted to improve the fit, and especially if over time there's a potential with steel running against that aluminum that this, this wall might become worn out over time. So if you look at that from the top, they look pretty much the same, but as we flip these over, you can really see the magic. What Shopsmith did was they extruded this or had it extruded um, where the side walls were taller than the bottom and the bottom has some grooves in it. So with this setting flush in a groove, when you tighten screws down in, the, the extrusion will bow in the center, bow down in the center and close up on your miter gauge. And we can easily demonstrate that. Um, by tightening these screws and we'll bring those sides in on that slot. <laughs> that is much harder to push. Easy here and then it tightens up. Now the Shopsmith miter bar itself does have a adjustable set screw that allows this uh, bar to expand as well, but we need much greater accuracy than that would provide us. With that kind of bulging out just in the center, there can be play at the miter gauge head. So by having that adjust as it does, we can get a nice, tight, smooth fit all down the run. And that's what we're looking for. We don't want a lot of play. So here's my first tip to prevent you from damaging your joint matic. One issue is if that slide is lowered down on top of anything down below, and it's very easy, you can see I'm already tucking some things down there. It's very easy to have something underneath that. And as you're cranking, that slide will hit, it'll stop traveling. And yet this, uh, this what do we call that? Hold on, I'm gonna look that up. What do we call that thing? 
the adjuster nut. <laughs> the adjuster nut will get pulled out of its position. Now, the first couple times that happens, it doesn't cause any damage, but then it does. So my advice to you is to cut yourself a piece of stock that's just a couple inches tall and 16, no, 17 and three quarter inches long. And with the best double-sided tape you can get your hands on, um, 3M VHB would be perfect for this. You could use the fast cap speed tape. All right, so I'm adding, uh, I've added some double-sided tape to the two ends of this. And we're gonna slide this underneath into the casting and bring it forward. And we're going to tape that against the inside of the casting. So that is actually about a half inch ahead of this steel rod. And that gives us enough room for that slide to work its way past. Lower this down like a guillotine. see be clear so that's going to prevent us if we were to stick anything up here from accidentally pushing it so far back that it gets caught under the slide we can still move the slide down so let's take care of that squeak as you know i use a lot of different lubricants this one is now sold under the brand name glide coat and uh, it is a spray wax and i like it and I don't like it. So uh, one of the problems is obviously we can get some overspray. So let's spray that on here and we'll spray it on the back. And then while it's still a little bit wet, we'll crank that through so it'll put some of it on our adjuster. You can see it's starting to haze up, which is what it does. Now, one other place I'm getting some squeaking is in this knob itself. So I'm gonna take that knob off and I'm gonna lubricate that. This is the same crank and knob assembly that Shopsmith used on their planer. I'm a big fan of this knob. I have used that knob on my Shopsmith Mark V for my height adjustment of my table. But inside of there, we have this shoulder bolt. So just give that a quick spray. And we should be back in business. <laughs> That's hilarious. I have not done a thing to adjust the sound. That is just how much more quiet it is operating. Probably need to add some lubrication here, but for now, I think we're good. Okay, so now I need to get this thing zeroed out. I need to know that that bit is perfectly flush with this table. So we do that using a straight edge that you trust. You could use a piece of wood here if you trust that it's straight. Um, I've got this set to where that bit is most definitely below the table. If I give that collet a spin, I'm spinning it from the back side there. You can see I'm not touching the straight edge. And I'll just crank the crank up, the slide up, the bit up as I rotate that. And what I'm looking to do is just come in contact with the straight edge. And so right now I am most definitely too high at this point. Go down a bit. I'm going to switch over to a piece of wood. If I can trust that this piece of wood is straight. There we go. Now here's the problem. This crank is in the wrong spot. Now as we use the joint matic, we're going to be counting cranks. We'll be turning that crank around and counting. Every time we turn it, it moves the bit a sixteenth of an inch. How in the world am I ever going to spin it around and stop at exactly this point? I can't. 
And so there's this really interesting feature that was built into this adjuster down below. Let me show you how it works. So now what I want to do is I want to rotate this entire adjuster without rotating the threaded rod. So by loosening this knob, I am now releasing the tension between the slide and the adjuster knob. And then below that, you'll notice there's a place where I can take my Shopsmith toolbox, the 532nd hex wrench, and we can stick that right into that hole. And we can rotate this adjuster, handle, and all. Once you're happy with the position of the handle, you tighten the knob and you're good to go. All right, there's one last thing we do. And that is, in order to eliminate the backlash, the play, imagine any nut that would be on this threaded rod, there'd be some up and down movement. We have now compressed the top nut and the bottom nut together. Well, there's a wavy washer underneath that. And so we take a pencil and make a mark anywhere on that top knob. And then I'm gonna loosen the knob on the back, holding the crank in place. I'm gonna rotate that to the back. So half a turn and then tighten this knob gently, gently. We don't need to over tighten that. Now, as we crank this up and down, if we make a minor adjustment, let's say we go beyond where we need to be and we go back, it's still very responsive. That takes care of the back backlash or the play. I will make one complete turn and I'll go beyond it by a quarter turn. Now I'm going to go back that quarter turn. See the adjusted that's taking place right there. Responsive both up and down. All right, we're going to make a finger joint here, and we're going to do that by uh, cutting a slot and then leaving a finger, and then cutting a slot and then leaving a finger, and doing the opposite on another piece. If we were making a box, we would probably double-sided tape these together, make a cut, flip it over, make the cut, same cut on the opposite side of the pair of parts, and then make the same on the other two. Now, one tip, two tips, really. Your stock needs to be accurately machined. It should be as square as you can possibly make it. Your cut should be nice and square as well. And you're going to get tear out as the bit passes through the wood. So back up your stock with a piece of wood. I'm going to add double-sided tape to this and we're going to stick that on. This is an eight inch long piece of stock. I made it eight inches because if I want to take this out and come in from the other side, it is perfectly positioned to be used on that side. The bit is rotating towards me though, and so for most of these types of cuts, I am moving my material from left to right. So right now, our router bit is flush with the surface. So to take a, a quarter of an inch cut, we're going to come up one, two, three, four turns. Four turns, that's four sixteenths of an inch, which is a quarter of an inch. I do not have to take this in one pass. If I want to, I could make a cut as the bit is being raised up, but I can't do that for any of the cuts that'll be trapped within the fingers. So I do have the option of holding this away from the slide, make a cut, move it a little closer, make a cut, and so on. Let's give that a try. And you can see just a hair there where my bit is a little bit high. Let's drop that down. One, two, three. So we're back at the position where I made that cut. 
So from here, I want to go up four turns. One, two, three, four, and we're going to switch pieces. Now, this is rough cut on this side, so I think it should be pretty easy to tell which one is the top. But let's mark these top like that so I can be sure to always make these cuts with that side facing up. There we go. Here you can see where we're headed. So now we have a finger and a finger. We need to create another finger by making another space. That's going to happen with one, two, three, four turns of the crank. Ah. Look at what I did. I miscounted. see that little bit of a finger there became part of a socket here. <laughs> Let's see if we can get these fellows to go together. There we go. Sorry, the lights causing problems. Finger joints or box joints, pretty simple for a tool like the joint matic. However, boy, do you have to pay attention. You have to do your math right, and you got to count properly and not lose place with the pieces that you're cutting. Otherwise, you'll end up making a joint like that. <laughs> now, one thing that's nice about this is it does show that with a smaller bit, like a quarter-inch bit, you can make larger cuts, just you're taking multiple passes. Um, this doesn't work, though, because I, I really, truly wasn't intending to do this. It just, I lost count. <laughs> So that's uh, finger joints. There's a lot more to do. We'll have to do raised panel doors, mortise and tenon, and a few other things. We'll do a midweek follow-up.
to answer your questions, comments, and cheap shots as usual. So leave those down below. And as always, thank you, channel members. I sure do appreciate your support. Make it a great week. See you midweek.